this is not our home. My kids know that. Brad and I know that. Uh, James 4.14 says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. This life is just a vapor. You know, reading the Bible since then, I mean, it's truth. It is real. It's not just a book that these people wrote thousands of years ago. It is God's Word. We've seen it. We felt it. Sometimes life hands us something so shocking and so aggressively distant from anything we've ever known, it not only doesn't seem real, it forces us to completely reconfigure the way we see this life. Today, Ashley and Brad Crow share just such an experience, and God's inevitable and undeniable presence through all of it to bring them to the amazing faith they know today. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast that places you right in the middle of the experiences that have changed people's faith and understanding of God in hopes that the mystery of God may become a little clearer for you. I'm your host, Stacy McCants, and our earnest prayer is that God speaks to you through this conversation. It's our experience that He faithfully answers this prayer every time, and we believe today will be no exception. Today's conversation is almost unimaginable, but stay with Ashley and Brad, because what you'll learn today could be a difference maker in your life. Please meet Ashley and Brad Crow. Ashley Crow, I had multiple people tell me I needed to talk to you last year. And I was like, okay, what's the deal? And so they told me the story. Mm -hmm. And I got to be honest with you, I couldn't do it at that Mm -hmm. time. I couldn't do it at that time. It was, uh, that was hard. Mm -hmm. And so I just trust God on those things. And I didn't. And I had people since then say, Hey, you should talk to Ashley Crow. <laughs> and so I prayed a lot about it. And I finally had somebody send me your contact info and reached out to you. And thankfully you knew who we were and what we do here. And you said, hey, I want to pray with my husband over this for a while. And um, you did. And you got back and we had a conversation. And after that, I feel like God stirred you up. And maybe started before then. And after we had that conversation, you texted me back and said, can I come tomorrow? (laughs) And I get excited when people say that because I know that God is moving them to do work for him. And so uh, after all this time, you are here today and your husband Brad is here also. Brad has decided to be in a support role. So he's beside you and with you and... Today, we are going to go through some tough stuff, but we're going to go through some tough stuff with the purpose of glorifying God and pointing people toward Jesus Christ and to let people in to the water that you guys have been into. And I think it's important because not many people are going to experience what you guys experienced, but they'll experience something similar in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's just going to happen. It's how life works. So anyway, thank you for answering the call and for being here and for getting in the car this morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I know that speaking is not one of the things that you like to do. (laughs) And I think that's one of the reasons Brad is here too, and I think that's great. And uh, (laughs) I think this is good. It's going to put you in a spot where you're a little bit uncomfortable, but you're doing things... um, you're doing kingdom work, and you've been called to do that. And so I'm I'm honored that you guys are actively looking to point people toward the kingdom of God through the things that you've experienced. So tell me about you and how you guys 
came together. Give me the backstory of Brad and Ashley Crow. <laughs> well, we met when we were three years old in three preschool. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I, I'm already sidebarring right here. I've got a picture. A kid came over here when he was four years old on Valentine's Day. I got a daughter who was four at the time, and he he knocks on the door with a dozen roses. Aww. And he came over, and I was not here. My wife was here. I was working at the time, and I was like, "What is going on?" So this this four year old. So we're like, wouldn't it be cute if they end up getting married one day? <laughs> and so that happened there to you, you guys. Yep. <laughs> All right, so continue. I'm sorry. Um, we grew up in church in Northport Baptist and um, actually never dated. We were good friends. We started dating in our second year of college, 2005. Got married in 2007. And I worked for two years. And until he graduated, he took the long route to, with engineering, he co opted several semesters, so it took him a while to get out. So I worked in that, I'm going to go off on this, we, I've always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. When I interviewed for that job, they asked me where I wanted to be in five years, and I said, I want to be at home raising kids. And they said, well, that's the most honest answer I've ever gotten. So like, you don't want to be with this company? And I was like... I mean, no. <laughs> and so they were like, okay. For a little while, maybe. But. Yeah. Um, so we were got pregnant with Jaden, and, you know, I was looking at daycares and looking at grandparents, keeping them, and I didn't think I could stay home because he was still in school, Brad was still in school. And anyway, we prayed about it, prayed about it, and I got laid off, and I was just so excited that God <laughs> had just said, you're going to stay home. And several people got laid off, and it was really emotional. It was a hard time for people, but for me, I just that was an answered prayer. God you knew. saying, yeah, "You knew, yeah, I I'm get that." Yeah. Home. Mm-hmm. So uh, we had Jaden in 2009, had Anders in on Leap Day 2012, Cora May 14th, and then Elijah August 28th of. 18, 16, 16, 8, 28, 16. That's Elijah's birthday. We've moved three times just this past week. We've got six chickens and a rooster and two dogs. And a cat. <laughs> <laughs> so man, this is a whole compound over there. huh? <laughs> That's good. So talk about your faith walk. Mm-hmm. In, in that evolution. I mean, that's the family, and, and, and that's pretty cool. What about faith? We both grew up very church-centered. Our parents had us both there when the doors were open. We went on every youth trip, uh, youth camp, mission trip. Like I said, we were good best friends, but not weren't interested in each other. So I guess that was good at the time. But I would say, like, both of our walks were very strong. I never had any real struggles, trials. I was on dance sign at County High, but, like, I never got invited to the parties or, like, I never had that. Temptation. Temptation, yeah. I'm a homebody, but, like, I never dealt with death or... I mean anything. Yeah, and you don't. I don't. You don't have to necessarily deal with it, with trauma mm-hmm. to come to faith of your own. One of the things I, I I often struggled with with people. So I didn't grow up exactly like that, but we were in church quite a bit. I grew up in rural South Alabama, and well, I mean our town had probably less than 6,000 people, so, and everybody went to church. Not everybody, but in my world, it seemed like everybody did, and so I kind of grew up similar to that and believed, but didn't really have a faith that was my own, Mm -hmm. I don't think. I don't feel like I had a tested faith. I I feel like I had an inherited faith. Mm -hmm. I believed what I believed because that's what my mama taught me and my grandmama taught me. Mm -hmm. It's like aunts and uncles, they all read their Bibles and 
go to Sunday school and church. And they're there on Sunday night, and we're going to go to the retreat. And boy, a revival's coming in August, and man, it's going, you know. And and that's just it was, it was sort of the Christian lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's what we were brought up in. And I don't know that I ever really understood anything, mm-hmm. really, about what Christ did. I mean, I, I heard right. it in the songs. I heard it in the scripture readings. I don't know that I digested that at all mm-hmm. until it was later. And so for me, and in my own faith walk, I had to kind of put it all out on the line at some point. And I was like, okay, if I just believe something because I was told to believe it by people that I trust and love, or do I believe it because it's true? Mm-hmm. And so I had to go out and do a search for truth. And I've talked to people who have not necessarily gone out and done a search for truth. And, and they tell me, I heard people tell me, it's like, I, I don't need to prove uh, creation through God for me to have my faith. I just, I don't need that stuff. I don't care about that stuff. And for me, I'm like, don't you need to know that, though? Don't, don't we need to know how that, how that stuff happens? And I guess over time, I've come to realize that you don't necessarily because if you've experienced God in whatever way you've experienced, if you truly have, in your heart you believe without a doubt. I mean, yes, there has to be a level of faith, but there's got to be a reason for faith, right? It's not mm-hmm. just blind faith. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I always, I always wonder about other people who have inherited their faith. Did something tr- cause a transition for them to say, I'm not riding that inherited train anymore? I have gotten on a different train of owning my own faith. If I had never been told about it before, what I've experienced now, this version of God, I now know that he, I know that Mm -hmm. it's real. And so I wonder, and and it seems like you guys are people who grew up with an inherited faith, just like me. And I don't know if what happened in this case changed faith for you. Mm -hmm. Or if you had something back early on, and it doesn't have to be trauma; it could just be an awakening. I mean, it could be sitting, it could be sitting at a lake somewhere one night, and all of a sudden have this new understanding of who God really is. It's like, oh my gosh, I get it now. All the things that the singing the little Zacchaeus song up the <laughs> sycamore tree and all that stuff, the Sunday school mm-hmm. faith. How, how does that resonate with you? Yeah, I would say. I had an inherited faith. The first being laid off, that was my first, like, that I can remember God just saying, this is what you're going to do. And he answered that prayer for me just straight up. And then the second that I remember is bringing us to homeschool. That was in August of 2019 um, that we started, but it was, probably a year, six months before that we, that I wanted to bring the kids home, or at least Jaden, bring our oldest home to homeschool before middle school. And Brad was like, "Eh, maybe we'll see. And then we went to a conference and I just felt God say and bring all of them home. I have all the kids, all four kids at home all day, and Brad was like, "Nope, we're not doing that. You're not. You're no." <laughs> wait, wait. What do you mean you heard God saying that? It was, I don't know. Just it was a, I guess, a burden, burdened on me. Like it, my heart would beat whenever I would think about homeschooling, but in a good way, not scared of it. Like I was excited to to take that on. What makes you think that was God telling you that? I had peace about it. Mm. I wasn't, it's not my idea at all. I don't have the patience or the knowledge or a teaching degree or anything, but I just at the time felt the peace to bring them home. And looking back, I know God was giving us that extra time all together to take trips and um, just be together at home. But you knew that was God. Mm -hmm. So I I like 
having those conversations because non-believers hearing people talk about hearing from God, they're like, oh, well, you, did you hear a voice, an mm-hmm. audible voice? Could you have recorded that with your iPhone? Could you video that? Right. <laughs> you know, they're skeptical and rightfully mm-hmm. so. But if it's true that there is a infinite intelligence creator God, which sounds really silly to people who don't believe in that, but it makes a whole lot of sense if you've taken a look at that, and you believe that it is spirit, then why wouldn't he move in ways that you gotta you got to be still a little bit to hear? And I, I'm always interested to hear what hearing from God is like for people. And most of the people, it's that. And for me, it's that. It is something that is pressed on you that is heavily pressed on you, mm-hmm. that you don't ever forget, and that, that does create a peace in you. It may be a little bit discomfort, but it's still a piece. And so all the check boxes, if I had to create check boxes of my own experiences and what I've heard from others, what you just described checks pretty much all those boxes. So it's, so it's cool. I like to I always stop people when they say they heard from God. Mm-hmm. God told them to do something. I'm like, oh, you better hold on. <laughs> yeah. I need a little more detail about that. So anyway, um, so good. He told you to be home with those kids. Mm-hmm. And Brad still wasn't on board yet. He was still had his doubts, and he teaches our Sunday school class, and he was teaching on God bringing us to something and then us standing in the way of it. And he said, for an example, he said, who am I to stand in Ashley's way when God's telling her to homeschool our kids? And he, you know, that at that moment, I knew that he was on board with me doing that. And, of course, I left the room crying because it was emotional. But that's another God thing that that Brad was okay or had peace about me teaching the kids. Yep. That's huge. (laughs) That's a big deal. I was more like Brad. My wife didn't tell me that God told her that she wanted to stay home with the kids. She she knew this from a long time ago. I didn't know this before. When she told me that, I was like, hmm, okay. Well, we're going to need to pull the budget out and see how this is going to work because yep. I don't see it. And uh, so I was more like Brad for sure. But um, but no, that's a big deal to, to hear from that. And, and I think you look back on things now and you're like, okay, there was much purpose in that. Purpose mm-hmm. I had no way of anticipating. Right. So you're homeschooling. You're home with the kids. You guys were able to take some trips and and do other things in life. Tell me what happened with Elijah. We were going on a road trip with my parents, taking the RV that they had bought and going to visit some farms and going to the beach and Dolphin Island and St. Stephen's, Bladen Springs, and then back home. And we got up that morning, and it was probably six-ish. We were going to meet my parents at Lowe's, and told Brad bye. Everybody gave hugs, and (laughs) then we went to Chick-fil-A and got our chicken minis and went over the bridge, and I took a picture of the sunrise. It was bright orange, and... I mean, at the time, I didn't realize it, but I took a picture of it. Orange is Wadge's favorite color. And we got to Lowe's, and my parents were there, and my brother, Scott, was there. And he helped my dad load the van on the trailer on the back. And he was going to follow us for a little while just to make sure all the straps and everything worked well. And... Before we left, Brad kept saying, make sure everybody's buckled all the time. I know, I know, I know. So we got to Montgomery and got to the campsite. I don't even know the name of it. Dad got out and paid the fee and everybody got back in. Cora had just found a lizard So she had it in a a cup and 
we were looking at that and we were in the campground so of course everybody wanted to go to the front of the RV to the big window and see where we were going and Raj was walking to the front and missed a step and fell down the stairs and the door wasn't locked and I saw it and I jumped out after him we weren't going 10-15 miles an hour um, but the second I saw him I knew that God had had him I knew that God had called him home and it was just weird. Like I had a, I didn't cry. Um, I just held him, and I called nine one one. And I don't know how I got out because there wasn't any service. My parents couldn't get their phones to work. But my brother was behind us the whole trip. And then once we got there, he went around in front of us to go ahead and go to the campsite. And so I just think that was a God thing that he wasn't still behind us during this. But he turned around and came back and was able to call Brad and tell him to come come out there. And we had several people coming to camp that we didn't know, but they came and prayed with us and sat with us and um, then we went to the hospital and they um, had me get checked out since I jumped out nothing was I just had scratches on me but I think that that was a distraction a good I don't know I don't know what I would have been doing during this time had I not been being checked out at that time. But all of our family drove to Montgomery. But some of my best friends came and I remember saying, like, I have no regrets with Elijah. I spent every single minute I could With him, with all of my kids, I've always tried to do that. They did go to preschool. They did go to, you know, school through for a little while. But I just, I love my kids and I want them to be people that I want to hang out with when they get older. And I've just tried to instill what I've learned growing up in them. And anyway, saying that I had no regrets with him, that I, he's only known love and happiness and joy and family and just good he's only known good and but I didn't catch him I didn't stop him and had a friend come up to me and grab my face and say Satan get out of here that's not of God God called Wyatt home, Psalm 139, 16. God knows all of our days. All of our days are ordained before we were even born. And God knew when he was going to call him home, and nothing I could do to stop that. I was thankful to be with family and friends, and just I could feel God and Brad got there, and he didn't know what had happened yet, and he saw me in the hospital bed, and first thing he said was, where's Lodge? And I said, he's with Jesus, and Brad fell to the floor. And then we just held each other, and... I 
our preacher was our preacher was there and he I mean took care of everything for us. I don't know. It was such a shock too that um I mean what what do you do? There's not a now you need to do this and now you need to do this. It's just everybody's different. When we got home, our house was full of people, which I'm thankful for. And, of course, when we would go on a trip, I would kind of leave the house a mess. Not intentionally, but I wouldn't clean up because Brad would stay home and clean the house for us and work on projects that he could do without the kids being home. So we got home and the house was a mess, but people were there. putting dishes in the dishwasher and cleaning off the table and, you know, just to me being the hands and feet of God, just doing things that I didn't do before, but they saw needed to be done and they just did it. Just comforting to come home to that. There's no, there's no playbook for that, and um, I can't. I am so sorry that you had to experience something like that. I still don't know why it had to happen like that, (laughs) but mm, that's, I don't need to know, I don't guess. He went out, and you went after him, Mm -hmm. while it was still moving. In 2 Kings 2, 11 and 12, it talks about God calling Elijah up in a chariot of fire. And that's just what I think about. Like, God called Elijah in the Bible up, and he went. And God called my Elijah up, and he went. And that that verse, Second Kings 2, 11 and 12, is on his tombstone, along with a little Jeep that he drove around every day picture of the Jeep that he would ride around in every day. On here a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, we had a little four-year-old boy that had drowned in a pool, Kennedy Bentner. Mm -hmm. It's the episode, it's the miracle of Kennedy Bentner. And so he was gone. He was bloated and gray and no pulp, no nothing. His dad's a doctor. Dad worked on him on the scene. Not there. And um, a miracle happened. And he walked out of the hospital a week later. And before he did that, he sat in his mother's lap and recounted to her what happened after she saw him the last time. And in his description at four years old, he never experienced the stuff that us people here on earth fear they experience. She described it as the way he described it was that he immediately was lifted up, like instantly. And the way she described it, with no hesitation, was immediately in the presence of God. It wasn't a struggle and suffering. And and, uh, I don't know what you saw. I can let my imagination go with what you saw. And I can't, I can't, I can't get it to 
Um, I can't get it to go. But I can um, take a little bit of earthly peace, I guess. And who am I, right? I'm not there. In knowing the kind of God that we serve. And I think we'd get to the end of this thing and we get up there and be like, man, we thought that was way worse than it really was. And, but that doesn't, it doesn't change what you experienced. I have lots of questions and I'm going to try to get to them as delicately as I can. But I think people live in this world with you. You have your version that probably very few, if any, people have. Um, but how did you initially respond to this? I guess I was more worried about my other kids. I had questions obviously of why God would take the baby and Jaden Anders and Cora are just amazing I tried to get back in school, try to make the routine normal again. Talking to the kids every day, being with them, them being home. We talked about what happened and we talked about John sixteen thirty three, that we will have trouble in this world, but God said... I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome this world. This is not our home. My kids know that. Brad and I know that. Uh, James 4.14 says, You don't know what tomorrow will bring. This life is just a vapor. You know, reading the Bible since then... It's, I mean, it's truth. It is real. It's not just a book that these people wrote thousands of years ago. It's, it is God's word. We've seen it. We felt it. So two weeks later, at two o'clock in the morning, when you're and probably, at least it's the case for me, probably in my mo- one of my most spiritually vulnerable times. I can't imagine with the load that you guys are carrying. Is this where you are? Because I wonder if a non-believer is saying, hey, what they just experienced, they got to bury themselves in something else. They're just hiding from dealing with this, with Scripture and this inherited faith thing or whatever. Because in that moment, when you're feeling the the most indescribable hurt you've ever felt in your life, by a long shot, when you are so immersed in this relentless agony that won't let you go, Were you thinking that God is is real at that time? Were you? It was any part of you saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! What the? What is this? Who are you? Are you? Could this be real? Could you? Have I have I been duped here? Did you get into any places like that? When I ask you about how you responded initially, you go right to servanthood. <laughs> go right to kids and lots of times we think moms I mean 
when when they get in a place where something's tough and real hard, they they just go be moms and they go serve and they go love other people, versus wrestling mm-hmm. with truth. They busy themselves. Mm-hmm. Talk about your confrontation with this God that you've believed in, or did you even have one? Did you stay busy and not let him have it? Did you stay busy and not even talk to him? What did it look like from a faith perspective? I was at my weakest, obviously, Brad has been by me every step of the way. I mean, I just see God being closer, more real, constant. I mean, he's all we've had. At the beginning, all we had to lean on. Of course, we had our friends and our family, but they're only... You know, they can only do so much loving and cooking and playing with your kids. But, I mean, just, I just had a a comfort. I don't know. I never had trouble sleeping. I just had a comfort that God had him. Still has him. Did you hope that or did you know that? No, I knew that. I know that. That hasn't been a question. Because these are hard things. This is impossible stuff. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff that destroys people. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff that destroys marriages and people. And for like a couple generations. They see it all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, I, I've only I've only tried to get into the water with other people on this. It ain't been my water, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I, I part of doing what I do is I, I get to get in this water every now and then, and I don't know how I'm responding to this. And I, I got to tell you, my my faith is more mature than it's ever been, and and I know in my heart I, I do, and and I I have a a fairly tested faith in different ways. And so I teach my kids about death and what it really is. Mm -hmm. And it's not anything to be afraid of. Don't worry about it. Life is actually eternal. And we're going to get to this place where we are in the presence of God and we're going to look back and say, (laughs) okay, that was just a way bigger picture going on there. And I know it hurt me at the time, but Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't even remember it anymore. It's so good now. So I, I believe that. And I, I don't think that's a thing that I just made up. Mm-hmm. I got reasons, lots of reasons to believe it. But I just don't know that I don't get sucked down when a thing like this happens. I don't know that. I'd like to think I wouldn't. And so I want to know what that pull toward destruction was like for you and how if you have because this is he he passed two less than two and a half years ago Mm -hmm. how you how you're joyful now Mm -hmm. i I know that grief is a lifetime thing Mm -hmm. i get that I, i don't think you get over it ever I don't believe. Right. Mm -mm. But how do you live with joy? How do you live with hope? How do you not get sucked back down into this? How do you not relive this with frequency and experience the earthly, raw emotion, pain, such that it begins to take you down a path to your own destruction? How, How does that happen? Well, I will say about eight or nine months after 9-11, it was in the summer, I was at home with the kids and just dark. 
9 11 mm-hmm. being 9 11 is known as <laughs> that other 9 11. This is 9 11 19, 2019. This is the day. My 9 11. Yeah. Okay. I was at home with the kids and just in a dark place and didn't want to continue. Grief isn't constant. It's not. It comes in waves as um, people that deal with it will tell you. Some waves are small and some waves are huge. And I don't remember what day it was, but um, I was just ready to call it quits and go see Jesus. But Psalm 139.14 came to me and it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. And I just stopped. God's works are wonderful, and I know that full well. That hit me in a different way. Because we think God only wants good, and He does. He has from the beginning, but He allows us to go through trials And I think that is to bring us closer to him and to know that he is constant and he is always here for us. And he made me Ashley. And I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And he knew he knows that and he knew that before I was born, before he gave me my four kids. And ever since that day, I have not wanted to leave this earth on my time whenever I go I know it's God's timing and I'm not going to have anything to do with that so you were sunk in all right so anytime there's Something of this magnitude. I, Job comes. The, the book of Job comes back to me, mm-hmm. and some of the most horrible things. And, and whether you believe that those events actually took place, or if it it is a sort of a story to to make a point about the way God works and uh, the way the enemy works. Mm-hmm. I think it's beside the point, I, but I, we believe that there are spiritual truths, deep, deep rooted spiritual truths in all of it. And it's there to teach us things. So in Job's case, I mean, he, he lost everything in like a day. Mm-hmm. All his kids, every single one of them, all his livestock home. I mean, everything. And God didn't do it to him. Mm-hmm. In fact, the enemy accused Job of something that wasn't true. So the enemy is an accuser, and we know that, and a liar, deceiver, mm-hmm. trying to destroy. Okay, And he asked God to get his hands on him just to prove that the reason Job was so loyal and faithful to him was because of all these blessings that he had. Mm-hmm. It's like if things don't go so good, guarantee you he curses your name. And what made God decide to go along with that? Mm-hmm. Only he knows. Mm-hmm. And I don't question that. But it didn't come from him. And so we are assaulted with things and, I believe, thoughts whose purpose is to destroy us. Mm-hmm. Right? So you're telling me it sounds like these things pulled you mm-hmm. into a place where sense of reason and thoughts of a loving God and other things like that probably didn't sound exactly as they are. 
Were you in a pretty serious place there? Or was it just a thought? Yeah. I was... I was ready to take action, I guess. That day? Mm Mm-hmm. Had you taken steps to take action? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. (laughs) And so, in that moment, when you're not thinking about heavenly things, Mm -hmm. are you saying that Scripture... Broke in? Yes. So what do you think happened there? I think spiritual warfare, the devil had me in his grips. And, you know, the Bible says, I will hide your word in my heart. Like growing up, knowing scripture and since this happening, we've learned a lot of scripture, more intentional. And my dad keeps going back to Psalm one thirty nine sixteen, which is the days ordained for us. And I mean, just knowing, having that comfort of knowing God's word in our heart and being able to use it in a time like that, in a time of such desperation that could have gone terribly I mean just having God's word literally on the tip of my tongue saved me did you change that day yes or did did it kind of keep going did you change that day nope instantly Mm -hmm. you changed Mm -hmm. that day Mm -hmm. your heart changed Mm mm-hmm can you describe that I just felt this isn't my life I'm here what's the scripture to live is Christ to die is gain that's right Um, that's in Philippians I think I mean I'm here to tell people about Jesus I'm not here to do things to have fun. Like, yes, I want to have fun while telling people about Jesus, but I'm here to spread his word, to spread his good news, to get people to accept him and to further his kingdom. And it's not about me and it's not, I'm not here for my own selfish pleasures. Yeah. Turns out serving Jesus but you're in probably the happiest place there. Right. <laughs> there is. Um, so a thing like this wouldn't just try to destroy you, but it would just try to destroy others as well. Mm-hmm. How would you say it has affected your marriage? It has brought us closer together for sure. We did do grief counseling, and our kids would go with us a time or two, and... I mean, I would say we had a good marriage before. Good communication, good. We're good. But something like this can really rock you. It wouldn't be the first marriage to end at the loss of a child. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, in my eyes, Brad could have easily left and blamed me. But he's... We've become closer because of this. Um, Just, I mean, our love for each other. I mean, honestly, the only way to explain it is God is the, God is the foundation of our marriage. And with our trust and hope in him, we come closer together. Yeah, that's not how this story ends for a lot of people. Mm -mm. And I always wonder, I've wondered what causes the, where where does the crack open up, even in strong marriages, when there's the loss of a child? And and I think you probably hit a someone assigns a, 
blame or guilt somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I just didn't, doesn't sound like that crack opened up. And to draw closer together in a time like this, uh, maybe, maybe it's more common than I think. I I just, in my mind, I, I hear of, I know people that, uh, I know many people who didn't make it because of the trauma of losing a child. And, and, and some of those were just illness that wasn't anybody present that could have somehow stopped it, it, it you know? And, and so that's a real threat. I think that's a real tool of the enemy. And, um, I want to know how you guys grew closer in the face of something that should, that was intending to tear you apart. And you said that your foundation is in, is in God. What does that mean? I don't, I'm not sure I understand that fully. What does that mean? Can he see? That's not an easy question. I get it. But yeah, I mean, you want to, Brad, you're here in the room. If you want to jump in on that, you, you're welcome to. And if you, however you want to do it, and if not, that's fine too. I would say in a marriage, Yes, I have. We have love for each other. But with Christ, He's our first love. Everything we live for and do is because and for Him, even marriage. So when, when we build our marriage around praying together, Scripture, church just when 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 our marriage revolves around Christ instead of each other i think that's how you build that foundation okay i hear people say it so the question and you answered part of it right there what does that look like in practice do you guys as a couple pray together beyond like the blessing at the table. Yes, not as consistently as we want to be honest. But yeah. yes, why do why do married couples? Most married couples I know are like, eh, I don't know about praying together. When you, when you pray together, you're you have to be honest and vulnerable with each other, and that's scary. <laughs> well, and here's the cool thing about that: when we start talking about a Christ centered or God first home. Here's, I think, what happens there. God's just genius, right? (laughs) He's God, so I guess he has to be. But when we do that, I believe, and it's not easy to do, but when we do it, what's happening there is that neither one of the two are putting themselves in the role as superior or the head or... You know what I'm saying? It's like you're both submitting to to the greater. And if you can humble yourself and actually pray together and actually talk about the goodness of God and and all the those other things, you're rightfully placing yourself beneath him together. Right? And so I'm no expert at that, but that's just my observation of it. And when you act as judge in any case, any case over the other one, you're putting yourself above. And that's the place that only God really belongs there. Yeah, and in our case, we talked about place and blame. I felt like if I were to place blame in her, that's taken away the sovereignty of God. I believe we talked about Psalm 139. God ordained every day of Elijah's life. From our world, his life got cut short. And God's view, his life was exactly how long it needed to be. And 
you know, I didn't have a place to blame her for that or myself or her dad or anybody else. Human nature tells you, though. Right. We go straight there. You, you, you let anything happen in the world, anything happen in the world, and you go to the news media, and the first thing it is, who's to blame? Who's to blame? We got to blame somebody. We go straight to it. And so that's not a, that's not a natural thing. But when you have the perspective of it's not my job to blame, I'm missing the point of I'm blaming. Blaming is only a path toward destruction, not toward peace, not toward anything that's going to make anything good or right or better. I don't know. I, I, I think that's legit. It's hard to do that. And I, I, I just got to say, you got to be in a place of your faith to recognize that and say, huh, that ain't my job. My job is to love. That's what you did. That's really, that, that is outstanding. I think that is critical in this conversation. Critical in this conversation. And I don't care if it's the loss of a child or the loss of a job. There's always things in life that are brought in to separate us from one another and to destroy us. And blame is just a really natural place for us to go. Really like to hear what the practice of putting God first in a marriage really looks like. There are other comments about what that looks like for you guys? Just, I just said, praying together is such a huge thing about especially any decision instead of her, like with homeschool, yeah, with her she could have easily just kind of, you know, forced her opinion. Like, this is what we're doing. But it wasn't that. It was, God has led me here. Let's pray about it. Yeah. And my initial reaction was, no, but I'll pray about it. Yeah. And through that, praying on our own and together brought us to a place of, that's what God wants us to do. Um, and, and it's uh, something that, we have to practice with everything, not just with big decisions in homeschool, but each and every day. Even now, we we set a goal of two to three days a week before I leave for work, we're going to pray together. Is that right? Just, oh, that's good. That's good. Just not about we're going to pray about something specific, but just for each other and for our family and for the spirit to move and, and that kind of thing. Do we always hit that goal? No. But that that is something we strive for because we believe how uh, of the importance of prayer together. I think that's whole that whole thing is a big deal, and I don't care how long you've been married and not prayed together as people of faith. I have a hard time believing that it is the will of God for us not to gather as a married couple and pray together. I'd have a hard time saying, hey, God, uh, let me ask you a question. Are we supposed to pray together? Is that a good idea? Should we do that? And God say, uh-uh, I'd, I'd rather y'all not do that. I think you guys should really make sure your, your faith is separate from one another and that you don't really get together in prayer. Can you imagine him saying that? That, that would be his answer to that? And if we, if we see that as people of faith, married people of faith, What's the problem? What's preventing us from praying together? And if you can say it's anything other than personal pride, I'd be interested in that. Please go to the website and tell me the thing it is that's not personal pride. And what you know in Scripture, even the most first grade pre-K person in faith knows what pride is. That's not of God. So I think even the most seasoned married people, if you're not praying together, and I'm talking to myself, flat out, we say, we pray in the blessing, and we don't just say God is great, God is good, and all that stuff, right? We pray for people in our blessing, and our kids pray in our blessings, and those are meals that ha- it happens every single time, And but it, it's not quick. It's not just thank you for this food, and bless this food, and nourish our bodies, and in Jesus' name, amen, right? It's not the standard prayer. We, we pray, but my wife and I, Going off to the side, uh, we don't. 
We did the other day. But I bet I can count on all my fingers and toes the times that we have done that in our marriage. We've been married for 13 years. There's no excuse for that. And when I look at you guys, and to go through the experience that you have gone through and continue to experience together, I think it's absolutely 100% critical and probably the major factor in why you're here together today and not, not. So (laughs) I've wanted to have a conversation with people who have navigated the loss of a child as a married couple before. And we didn't go into this with that, but it is a question I have and I've asked it before and it's, there's a way to do it. And it is only with God at the center. And you guys do that. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that. Brad had committed to not getting in to the conversation, but I'm glad you're here. (laughs) He's got no headset on or anything like that. He just pulled up a chair, which is awesome. How is faith different for you now? It's real. It's, I mean, I've got to teach my faith to my kids daily. I've got to teach that God is real and, I mean, his ways are always better than anything I can plan or want. Yeah, and I tell you what, if you're going to do that, your kids aren't stupid. If you're going to teach your faith to your kids, if you're going to tell them that God is real and you don't believe it, or you're not in, Mm -hmm. (laughs) they'll see right through that. Mm -hmm. So then I guess maybe my question is, what what does your faith walk look like now? What are you doing to strengthen your relationship with God and understanding of Him and to know Him in a deeper way? What does your daily faith walk look like? It's daily Bible reading. I do it not every day by myself, but I do it every day with the kids. We have a plan. I actually skip around with different, I wouldn't say curriculums, but different versions of what to read each day. Like I don't follow a specific plan. I go with what our day brings and we read those scripture and we're learning Ephesians 4 now, Ephesians chapter 4. The kids don't have it as well as they want, but I mean, they're hearing it daily and they keep me accountable with the reading and just having them home daily, all the emotions of, I mean, still the kids or I will break down. And knowing that we pray first, I didn't grow up doing that. I grew up kind of brush yourself off and let's keep going. But I'm trying to keep teach my kids to pray first. That's the first You want to ask God first, not mom or dad or friends. I mean, God's got the answer, so why not go to him first? He's got the comfort and the the words for you to comfort you. What what does prayer look like for you? Ashley's prayer life. It's constant. I never... End it. Um, I wake up praying, praying for, praying out loud, praying for our family. I mean, honestly, yeah, my kids see me talking to myself (laughs) and they think nothing of it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about, we read about pray without ceasing, right? That's in scripture. And Mm -hmm. it's, and, and I think people are like, okay, so are you like, Dear God, 24-7, every day where you're literally mumbling to yourself? <laughs> or wh- what, is, what does pray without ceasing look like in practical life 
I mean, for me, it's just a conversation that I would have with you. Like, it's just talking to God, saying, you know, God, help me with this math uh, lesson today. You know, give me <laughs> Let me tell you something. Patience. I don't do homeschool. I get those brought to me. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be that, that's like red sea parting to me uh kind of prayer for me to be able to do those anyway I, I don't know how you do that but sorry yeah no i mean honestly it is just god help me with yeah and and i, I get that too but sometimes sometimes for me and i have probably been better at that lately like the last year or so than I probably was before. But for me, it's more of an awareness of the presence of God all the time. Because mm-hmm. before, it was like, okay, I'll read, i have like my quiet time. I'll read scripture and do some prayer time or whatever. And if it's a good day, and I can maybe get down here and pray for 45 minutes, an hour, or something like this. It's like, whoo, that's great. Mm-hmm. And then life starts, right? And you're out and activities, and there's work, and there's all the things that, that we go and do. And then you should like increase the amount of time you spend with God. And, and, and to the point, it's like, okay, I feel the spiritual fatigue almost. It's like, all right, how much Jesus stuff can I do in a day? <laughs> it's <laughs> like, I'm going to watch the basketball game at some point or whatever. <laughs> but it's, but for me, I think the transition came when I began to realize that, um, that it was just being aware of the presence of God. Right. You don't mm-hmm. have to talk to him all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, my wife and I don't talk all the time. Sometimes we sit and watch an Amazon Prime masterpiece show, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't say a word, but we're there together. And if something's up, we, we, we just recognize each other's presence. For me, that's what yeah. that prayer without ceasing has, has come to be. I mean, and if something happens that I clearly was God like breaking in, it's almost like I'll do like a little internal fist bump or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the right word for it. Is, yeah. it any like, is it like that for you? Are you in dialogue? No, yeah, we're, I'm definitely searching for God in just the everyday more yeah. and more. Well, I tell you, one of the things that helped me out is is a book that a guest recommended some months ago that I have read multiple times. And it's it's not necessarily for the one who's looking for faith, but it's one who has, has a faith that is looking for, to kind of understand what it really means like means to be in constant prayer or, or the other things like that. And, and the book, it's got a couple of different titles, variations of the title, but the main title you'll find if you, if you look it up, it's called the practice of the presence of God. Mm-hmm. Brother Lawrence is the guy who is being quoted in this. And, and basically the guy, so he lived in the 1600s and at 18 years old, he had, he was like sitting in a field and saw a tree without leaves and, and just this realization that that tree was going to bring forth leaves and fruit and the seasons and, and the way God moves. It, 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 it just changed his perspective. It was, a, it was an epiphany, really. And, and, and so he ended up getting some of the job, and then he moved into like this monastery. And all he basically learned how to do was just practicing being in the presence of God. And so he he has these conversations with this guy, and then he writes letters to this guy. And basically the book is sort of the amalgamation of all of those letters and conversations. And it is, it is unreal. It has changed the way I look at the way I serve God daily, completely changed it. So we talk about that and what our daily faith walk looks like. I think that book has probably changed the way I do it as much as anything else. I would encourage you to read it, and I would encourage all the listeners to read it. I'll, I'll put a link on the, in the, on the website and in the show description, too. It's just, aside from the Bible, it's probably the most impactful book that I've ever read about in my faith, and I've read countless mm-hmm. books in that way. I can't get out of here without asking this question. What would you say, and i got a couple more questions, but this one, this one's pressing me. What would you say to the, I don't know, newly bereaved parent or just bereaved parent that is really, really struggling? I mean, really struggling in like in a dark place and they can't get out of it. Based on your experience, what would you say 
to that person. David comes to mind. Second Samuel, I don't know the chapter. He's his son has just died, and while his son his son was sick, while his son was sick, he was fasting and tearing his clothes and mourning and praying to God and you know doing all the all of that. But after his son passed away. The servants were scared to tell him because they didn't know what how he would would react. But when they told him, he got up, got dressed, and ate. And Second Samuel twelve twenty three. Uh, but now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back? Again, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So if I know that I will see. God first. I know that I will see Elijah again because I have my faith in God. I have asked him into my heart. I know that I will go to heaven and see them again. I have that reassurance. I am sad that he is physically not here with me, but I am joyful that I will see him again. And I'm excited and I look forward to to that day. And in my In our prayers every night, I say, I can't wait to see him again soon. And soon being whenever God's timing is. And I know that's not mine. But just, I mean, if you're walking with God, you've got that reassurance that you will see your kids again, your your loved ones again. Yeah, I would say the same thing is to cling to God. Because that's all, all we have. As far as addressing an unbeliever other than turn to God (laughs) this probably sounds all insane and crazy to someone who doesn't believe but I can look over our life the last two years and know that it is very real and also too I would say and this can go for anybody but talk to other bereaved parents they know the feelings and the things that you're you're not everything's not exact of course but i don't know just conversations are more meaningful when you know that the person you're talking to knows what you're going through yeah have you guys found support yeah and it's kind of come from a very strange place in that it's not local (laughs) yeah yeah um uh, there's a a well-known country music artist granger smith Uh uh they lost their son almost the exact same age just a few months before we lost Elijah. Very similar situation. And and his wife is uh, Amber, very vocal about just, or, or not vocal, but I get public mm-hmm. in her grief. And also in sharing kind of just where she is. So Ashley actually reached out to her on Instagram and she replied back. And they have had conversations and it's just Instagram messages. Mm-hmm. But knowing that she's been through something similar and that those two moms that can communicate back yeah. and forth. It's just, I don't know, something's comforting about that. And then we both follow both of them on Instagram and just seeing the, the joy that they still have in their life mm-hmm. is encouraging for us to keep going in yeah. our life. That community is is probably an important thing. I know uh, Jamie Dor was on here. Um, she lost. She and her husband Jake lost a son after they had lost a daughter in miscarriage. Lost a son at just a couple of months old, and she expresses a lot of that through her Instagram account as well. And um, Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, I have uh, a lady coming in here uh, who lost her son. Uh, he was 23 at the time to a motorcycle accident, and she began to blog about it. And she had been immersed in Scripture for 20-something years before that, so she is a student of Scripture. And uh, so she has a blog that has over 3 million people <laughs> that have visited, and it's called um, The Life I Didn't Choose. 
so there's some other resources. I can share those with you later. I know we're just talking now, <laughs> which, which is fine. But those are, um, oddly enough, I, I'd been talking to her for months, and she's coming in literally tomorrow. And I don't ever like to, for them to do this close, but I always know that God has a purpose for that. So I, I'll, I'll share that with you later also. What do you know about God now? that maybe you didn't understand before. His ways aren't always our ways, but I mean, we've seen him move in tremendous ways because of this tragedy that that we were wouldn't have been looking for otherwise. He's comforting um I mean, he's all we need. He provides. Is he real to you because he has to be real? Or is he real to you because you've experienced him? Definitely I've, because I've experienced him. I mean, I've experienced him before this tragedy too. But since, I mean, I know if something doesn't go my way, uh, I know God's got a plan for it and I'm not going to stress about it. I mean, I do stress about it. I'm not saying that, but I just, I know that God's got a better, better way of doing things than I do. And if it doesn't go the way that I'm wanting it to, I just got to trust his, his ways are going to work out for his glory, for his, the way he wants. Yeah. And, and this is awful, this whole everything, no doubt, but ultimately for yours too. That's one of the things I think we miss. Mm -hmm. Because we can't see past now. Right. We can't see past now. Now hurts too bad. Mm -hmm. Or now is too joyful. I can't say, you know, carpe diem, right? We can't see past now. And even in something like this, we're taught by him that the story's just not over yet. It's like, it's not over. Don't stop now, because the story's not over. And that's hard to see, and that's hard to, it's hard to understand in, in the valley of the shadow of death. But we gotta, we, I think if someone asked me that question, that's probably what I would have to end up getting to, I think. Is it just, it's just not, the story's not over. It doesn't end here. There's a lot more to this story. It is a hard place right now. And I, God, if you can make this the hardest place, please do, because I don't know that I can get much worse than this. Mm-hmm. You know, I get that. I don't get it, but I, I, under, I, can, I can understand that. Mm-hmm. But um, that it's not over. Do you have joy? Do you have real joy? I do. I mean, yeah, this life, it's for God. Like, I see pictures of you sometimes on social media, in, in the research or whatever. The faces of this family of six where only five are in the picture. And I see expressions that aren't masking something dark. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how is that possible? Why don't I see the pain of Elijah's absence in their faces it's definitely felt we know in every family picture that he's not there but again we have that that joy knowing that he's not dealing with COVID he's not dealing with the craziness of this world today he's safe he's happy he's joyful he's with Jesus he's we're going to see him again and I mean I can't be sad in that. I can't be sad in knowing that God's got him and that I'll see him again. I just can't be sad in that. Of course, I do have days where I am sad that I physically miss him. But, I mean, all in all, God's got him. Yeah. You can't not be sad. (laughs) You can't not grieve 
But I feel like if we really believe in God, and it's not our inherited faith that we believe in, but if we really believe in Him, there is something to look to for joy. Mm-hmm. Because if all we look at is the hardest thing that we've experienced, there will never be joy in that. And so when I see your faces in those pictures, I think some people would say, how can they smile like that? And say that with a little bit of a judgmental tone. And I think other people would say, how can they smile like that? With a tone of, I want to know that hope. (laughs) Mm -hmm. These people love their kid. Mm -hmm. They love all their kids. Elijah no less. And to be without him now rips them up. Mm -hmm. I get it. But how somehow they're still able to smile like that. I want to know what that is. People want to know what that is. People don't have people don't know that like they need to. I think. When I talk to you, I see what it is. We should do a video component of this because we're miss <laughs> We miss people's faces when we don't. But I can see it. Mm-hmm. Is there anything I did not ask you about that you'd like to mention? I'll listen to Josh Gambalvo. Jim Balvo, yeah. Jim Balvo. And he said when his son passed, he didn't want people to forget him. And absolutely 100%. Um, same for us. And... uh Kristen and Sam Marcinick through Baseball Country have just been there for us. Like after Elijah's celebration of life, we went to their house and spent the night. And um, they just mean so much to us. But they have a fund that they started, a scholarship, Elijah Crow Scholarship Fund, for people to be able to go to baseball camps in the summer and throughout the year um, just to bring people to hear the gospel out there and in ways that maybe they couldn't afford to go or whatever reason, just to get, get the gospel out to more people that normally wouldn't be able to maybe come out to baseball country otherwise. or Okay, yeah. So Sam was episode seven. <laughs> he told his story on here. So you guys are close. Mm-hmm. You actually stayed out there. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. <laughs> I, I, I love these connections. And I, I'm trying to think. Josh was on here as well. Uh, Josh Giambalvo. And it was on June 1st. It, this doesn't have the number episode it is. But uh, anyway, I remember him saying that. And, and <laughs> extending the life. Of your child. So how can people contribute to the scholarship? There's two, actually. Um, baseballcountry.com, and then there's a donation drop-down, and it's it's Elijah Crow Scholarship Fund, I believe. Okay. And then there's Maridzo. It's in Kentucky. We go there every summer. Elijah went twice, and they're very, very close to us, near to our hearts. Lonnie Riley started that ministry, but we also have a fund with them uh, for college students to be able to use it and however they need. So I will, um, so I'll include links to both of those on the uh, website and in the description. So as whatever player you're listening to this on, if you want to be able to access uh, those scholarship funds, uh, you should be able to click the link right there on the. Uh, description. So those things are going to be on there as well. Well, I, you know, sharing these things, and I, you know, I, I was concerned about. I'm always concerned about parents having to relive such things. I think I found that being able to express a lot of these things for parents isn't a bad thing for them. I think I'm more scared of it than they are. And so for you guys to be able to bring this story 
And not just the story of losing Elijah, but the story of navigating the loss of Elijah as a married couple, as individuals, and the ways that you are able to identify God's presence in it, the way you went from a over your, the course of your not life, not just with Elijah's uh, event, but went from your inherited faith into one to where when the chips are actually on the table, you're all in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's something we, we should share with one another more often. Because mm-hmm. I think we can talk about faith, but when... When life hits us as hard as it can, I'm not sure how many are reaching for faith. And the ones that do, because they know it's true and they know it's real and they've experienced it, tend to get to where you are. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed that this happened less than three years ago and you are in a place as a family where you point to Christ as the way you still exist (laughs) and uh, exist as a person, as exist as a married couple, exist as a family, um, the way you're directing your kids. It's an amazing example And I think you would say that it is just God breaking into a situation where where you guys were already fertile ground for him. Think of the parable of the sower and the seed. When it fell on good soil that was primed, ready to receive it, it was able to produce fruit and you know, the seed that fell on the, the path, the rocky ground. It wasn't. And so when I look at you and I think about your faith background and what you described in the way that you approached God together, the way you still pray together, I see that as is why you're where you are. So um, for you guys to come and share that stuff and open all that stuff back up uh, to point people toward Christ is awesome. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate you guys doing that and coming together. Mm-hmm. I really, I thought you were, I thought you were going to roll in here alone, and I saw Brad. Kind of, I was like, "Cool, do I need to go set up this <laughs> other mic? It'll be great." But you guys uh, shifted it over, and it worked out. It worked out well. So, um, anyway, guys, I just want you to know, and I think I speak for people listening to this that you are being prayed for that you are loved and um, I think you're going to, I think you're going to help people. I really do. And I think you're doing that already. And uh, so Brad and Ashley Crow, I'm just so thankful for you and I'm thankful to get to know you. And um, I hope we can find ourselves doing kingdom work together again. Thank you for having us on here. It's amazing to me how a family who endured what the Crows experienced can live with such joy and hope. Yeah, I know that our hopes to be placed in the presence and promises of God. But to see that teaching put firmly into practice like Brad and Ashley have honestly done should give us a clearer picture of its truth. There certainly have to be tough days. But when they tell me that God comes first for them, And they have real internal peace and even joy because of that. I can't help but realize that there really is nothing that can separate us from God's love and the promise of our existence with Him in that love forever. And little Elijah Crow will never be forgotten. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. We ask that you pray for Brad and Ashley and so many others who have experienced some of the toughest trials life can offer. Pray for their faithfulness to God, which we know is the only route to true peace and life. 
Elijah Crow's life continues to bless others in many ways, one of which is the Elijah Crow Scholarship Fund through an organization known as Baseball Country. This fund not only sends disadvantaged kids to baseball camp, it pours into some of the poorest nearby communities, providing kids opportunities for fun, hope, and the message of Christ to kids that might not otherwise hear it. To contribute to this fund, please find the link in the description of this episode on our website or the player you're listening on now. You can also visit BaseballCountry.com, click Donate, and select the Elijah Crow Scholarship Fund in the Purpose drop-down menu. You can also contribute to the Elijah Crow Fund through the Marizzo Center by following the link in this episode's description or by visiting marizzo.org. That's M-E-R-I-D-Z-O dot org. To connect with us, recommend a guest, hear more episodes, or support this ministry, please visit astrongerfaith.com. Until next time, we pray for peace, a stronger faith, and the experience of the presence of God for you and those you love.